In the dark days of the early 2010s, when I was first learning the internet, I got really into this comic by Hima Daisy about Persona 4, which had become a hugely popular fan comic, getting lots of fan dubs on YouTube, which is how I found it, and it even got an article written about it by Griffin McElroy? You know, this guy. Small world, I guess. The creator of the comic stopped updating it and went on to do other things like Cucumber Quest, which I was also a fan of, having no clue they were made by the same person. Again, small world. Because the comic never finished, I had no context for what happened next in the game, and coming from a strictly Nintendo and Xbox household, I couldn't even play the game myself as it was PlayStation only. Fast forward to my senior year of high school, I got a job, and for once I had disposable income, and the first thing I spent it on a PS Vita and a copy of Persona 4 Golden. I was gonna finally achieve my childhood dreams and figure out what the hell was going on with Persona. Now see, two key things happened between me finding the Hima Daisy comic and actually getting to play it. I came out as bi and my brother came out as trans. And now that I have a personal stake in the LGBT community and had unlearned my homophobia and transphobia, I was fully prepared to be very upset with the contents of Persona 4. You see, as opposed to other games of the time period where they just chose to pretend like LGBT people didn't exist, Persona 4 decided it was going to take a stand and address it. Unfortunately, due to many factors, such as it being 2008, society being pretty homophobic in both Western and Eastern culture, and Atlas is a big name video game company, they handled it pretty damn poorly. So warning here, this video is going to address some pretty bad instances of homophobia and transphobia, and there's going to be some minor to major spoilers of Persona 4. But first, let's talk about what Persona 4 is actually about. The plot of Persona 4 revolves around the protagonist and his friends from high school solving a series of murders that occur in their town using supernatural means. Due to unknown reasons, the protagonist has the ability to enter a different world through televisions and brings his friends along with him in order to do battle with shadow beings using personas, which grant the protagonist's powers. There's a lot more to the plot than that, but that's the gist you need for the purposes of the video. While the protagonist has his persona pretty much from the get-go, for unknown reasons, in order for the other party members to unlock theirs, they must fight boss battles with their shadow selves, which are warped versions of aspects they reject or dislike about themselves. For the first two party members, these battles are more like tutorial fights, but for the rest of the unlockable characters, you must first save them from being killed by battling through a whole dungeon first themed around their insecurities and secrets. You find out what character you need to save next by seeing them appear on the Midnight Channel, which is a mysterious channel only viewable at midnight when it's raining and it's somehow connected to the TV world. For a game about high schoolers, these dungeons get uncomfortably sexual. Which brings us to the first big problem of the game, Kanji Tatsumi. When first introduced to Kanji, you see him as a big scary punk with bleached hair, facial scar, punk clothes, and a delinquent scowl, but after seeing him on the Midnight Channel after being kidnapped, however, a different side of him is revealed as his shadow self on the TV talks like a stereotypical gay guy and speaks predatorily towards men. From the interactions the team has with Kanji prior to his disappearance, he has multiple times denied being gay, out of nowhere, but this is supposed to be his true self, especially compared with how it is with all the other characters. While all the other shadow selves you have to fight in the game are also similarly gross and exaggerated, this is still pretty nasty stuff, especially when compared to other interactions Kanji has with Yosuke, who says violently homophobic things to Kanji and they're treated as a joke. Because after all, he's the best friend character. He can do no wrong. He's just funny. So funny. When you get to the final boss of the dungeon, Kanji has a confrontation with his shadow self, culminating in him yelling, You're not me! Causing the shadow to turn into a monster. Kanji's boss is a huge muscular male figure holding two large Mars symbols because it's 
symbolism. Get it? After defeating the boss, Kanji has to admit that his shadow is a part of him or the shadow will just keep attacking the party. Now, you'd think that because this whole dungeon was themed around Kanji being gay, he would be, you know, confirmed to be gay, like an actual gay character. But Atlas still somehow gets away with leaving whether or not Kanji is actually gay ambiguous, with him going on about how it's like, actually, just that he has feminine hobbies, like sewing, and he, he was scared girls would make fun of him, and that's why his shadow self says he hates women and he swears, Yosuke, where are you going? Don't run, he's not actually gay. <sighs> Atlas has stated that his orientation is left up to the player's interpretation, which is cheap, to be honest. And it's clear from later scenes with him that he's still questioning himself, despite his acceptance of his shadow self. One of these scenes brings me to the other grave injustice this game committed, Naoto. While Kanji's situation was not handled the best, it was at least still up to interpretation. The situation with Naoto, however, does not have that luxury, and it's pretty badly handled. Naoto is one of the last playable characters to be unlocked and is introduced to the player as a boy detective. It's later revealed by the game, however, that Naoto is assigned female at birth. And while the game claims that Naoto is actually a girl, the way their arc is written leads me to think otherwise. So for this essay, I'm going to be referring to them with neutral pronouns, despite the fact that, honestly, I think that they're a guy, but because of all the you know, fuzziness around it. I'm just gonna go with neutral. <laughs> Atlas has not had a very good track record with trans characters, but with uh, Catherine and Catherine full body. With Catherine including a trans woman who is repeatedly made fun of and treated as a man disguising herself as a woman, and Catherine full body having a trans scare main character where the protag is shown gawking at her genitals, and this was used in all of their promotional material as like a funny, oh, what what is he looking at? She she must have like a penis or something. <sighs> Naoto is just another addition to the list. In one of the first scenes with Naoto, we see them talking with Kanji, and through a misunderstanding, Kanji thinks that they're hitting on him and is confused because he's a guy, and I'm a guy, but he's interested in me. They also end up enrolling at the same school as the other characters, where they quickly become very popular with the girls. But Naoto has no interest in any of them. How strange. A boy who doesn't want to be popular with girls? How weird. It's almost like boys who are attracted to girls exist. <laughs> up until this moment, though, there's nothing strange about Naoto. They look a little younger than the others, but they're a year younger, so that makes sense they completely pass as male. However, they do end up being captured and thrown into the TV world, and it's in their dungeon where things take a turn for the worse. In the Midnight Channel debut, they mention some sort of life-altering surgery in which they will walk a new path of life. And to some, they may have no clue what the fuck this means, especially if they haven't been spoiled to Naoto's plotline. But it's clear that it's in referral to gender affirmation surgery. Their whole dungeon is themed around a mad scientist base in which Naoto's shadow is constantly hinting at this experimental surgery, while the characters cluelessly wonder what the hell it's about. Once you get to the end and you see Naoto arguing with their shadow, it seems at first that what they're referring to is insecurity about age, saying, I want to be a big boy now, but until their shadow makes the remark, you can't cross the barriers between sexes, this is where the characters learn that Naoto was not born male. And their reactions are abysmal, to be honest, especially in this day and age. They immediately remark, Naoto's a girl, and switch pronouns without even consulting Naoto to if that's what they want to be called, or even asking if that's fucking true. After the boss battle, Naoto explains that they felt belittled by the police they worked with and says that, while one day I will change from a kid to an adult, I'll never change from a woman to a man. And also, this whole comment about I'll never change from a woman to a man heavily implies that trans people do not exist and that it's impossible for you to tr change between the gender. So e even ignoring the fact that, you know what, maybe Naoto isn't a guy, but 
this, if you're watching this or reading this or playing this and you are a trans person and you see this, they literally say it's impossible to pass the barriers between the sexes. Like, it's impossible for trans people to exist. It's impossible for trans people to be respected because they won't ever really be a boy or a girl or whatever. Which, it, what the fuck? It, it's abysmal. Anyways. And they say that their sex doesn't fit their ideal image of a detective, as all the detectives in media are big, strong men. Never heard of Nancy Drew Atlas. Yukiko then remarks, Then you must know you don't really want to be a boy, right? Which, okay, Yukiko, um, you don't know what's going on in their head. You don't know anything. Calm down. It is not your gender. And after Yukiko says that, Naoto relents that, yes, in fact, they're not trans. They just didn't know lady detectives existed. It's like feminism or something. So it's not transphobic, it's feminist. Despite the fact that multiple times Naoto states they hate being a woman, describes discomfort when being referred to as a female, hence the beauty pageant scene, which is disgusting, and says on multiple occasions that they want to be male, and their shadow self, which literally is them, says, I want to undergo a surgery so I can finally be a man. But no, not trans at all, just a misguided woman. And for the rest of the game, everyone immediately switches pronouns for them, which if only they would do that for people who had come out as trans and not people who were revealed to be a certain gender assigned at birth. If only it went the other way around. When playing through the game myself, this was incredibly uncomfortable. As I myself viewed Naoto as a trans man who gets outed and isn't able to admit they're trans yet due to everyone around them not even giving them that possibility. And for the rest of the game, I have to deal with this character constantly getting misgendered in my eyes and it being treated as completely normal and even comical. I mean, even after they recover from being kidnapped, they continue to wear a boy's uniform and say, continue to treat me as you did before, which apparently does not include referring to them as a boy, apparently. Even worse, if you choose to pursue a romance with them, you can convince them to start dressing more like a girl in order to be with you, which is just so fucking awful on so many levels. There's also a running theme of Kanji being attracted to Naoto and it being treated like Naoto is diet gay to him and that being attracted to Naoto is his saving grace. With the horrible remark he makes in regards to Naoto entering the beauty pageant, clear those doubts from my head, Naoto, make me a man, which is not just homophobic and transphobic, but biphobic as well? I mean, Kanji literally functions as bi in the entire game because despite all of his insecurities about you know being gay he does on multiple occasions express being attracted to women you know he's still attracted to naoto after it turns out they're a girl and they you know find the girls in their yukatas pretty and other such instances but and for some reason, it's one or the other. He can't be bi, he has to be gay or straight. And there's no other option. Not even once do they mention the fact that he could possibly be attracted to both. He has to prove that he's attracted to women, but he doesn't have to prove that he's not attracted to men because being attracted to women excludes the possibility of being attracted to men, which is wild. It's absolutely wild. While Kanji and Naoto are the biggest examples of bigotry in the game, I also want to address the topic of Yosuke. Yosuke is one of the biggest sources of homophobia in the game, with the whole camp scene being a thing. There's also a bit during his social link, bonding time if I haven't mentioned it earlier, in which the player hugs him when he starts crying, and he remarks, You dumbass, that's for girls. However, that scene may be evidence left over of a scrapped romance route between Yosuke and the main character, which is a whole other thing. It's one thing to fuck up the writing of gay and trans characters, but then to also think of including the only gay romance option in the game and then scrapping it? Which is to say, barring Naoto, but since the game thinks of Naoto as a woman, I'm not gonna count it. 
they don't count it as gay. His social link is still pretty bromancy in that he has a positive reaction when you answer you're not interested in any of the girls. His final speech and his social link describing the main character is different from his family and even friends. And it even has an event flag, which is only ever used in romantic social links to diverge between do you want to continue being friends with this girl character or do you want to date her? And the event flag for Yosuke is the aforementioned hub. But in addition to that, there are also unused audio files stored in the game for both the Japanese and English versions, in which Yosuke says, I like you, in what definitely sounds like a romantic context, and the Japanese indicating that it's in reference to the protagonist. I focused all my attention on the murders to avoid having to confront myself. So long as I don't try, nothing will change even if we catch the killer. Right now, I'm just plain old me. And I want to do what I can with everything I got. With you guys. I never knew I had such heat inside. Don't make me say stuff like that. Don't go. I like you. This is huge. And that if it was still included in the game, Yosuke's homophobia could be explained with his own internalized problems, like Kanji. Or without that in game context, you just have the main character's best friend saying some vehemently homophobic stuff with no repercussions and no option for you to tell him that's messed up. Because in the context of the game, you're supposed to be homophobic too. And there's no wiggle room for your own interpretation of how the main character react. All of the options are either you could playfully say, oh, oh, Yosuke, stop saying that. Or you could agree with him. Those are your options. You don't get to stop the whole game and be like, hey, Yosuke, that's really messed up that you're saying all these things because the game doesn't care. The game doesn't care because it doesn't care about homophobia. It thinks it's funny. There's even an example of an earlier Persona game, Persona 2, literally including a gay romance between the main character and a party member. So because of this, it feels super plausible and it's really disappointing it isn't in the actual game. So, I know I've mentioned this briefly throughout the essay, but I'd like to go into depth for those who are unfamiliar with the cultural difference between the LGBT community and their reception in America and Japan. In general, Japanese society tends to be more subtle than America and how they go about being oppressive. While America sings how much they hate you from the rooftops, Japan just quietly turns their shoulder. Japan has typically been regarded by Americans as being way more tolerant due to their lack of hate crimes and anti-LGBT legislation, but that also doesn't mean they have pro-LGBT legislation. Discrimination still exists at a systematic, institutional, and individual level, and while you may not be killed for being gay in Japan, the suicide rates for LGBT people in Japan are extremely high, so instead they just bully you into doing it yourself, I guess. And as recently as March 2021, they only just deemed a ban on same-sex marriage unconstitutional. However, it's still not legal for gay people to be married, it's just also not illegal. Which is a very strange legal loophole, it seems, as there needs to be legislation outright stating that gay people can get married. In addition, some Japanese municipalities will issue partnership certificates for LGBT couples, but it doesn't award the same rights as a marriage certificate does. Aside from some legal stuff, Japan also tends to view being gay differently than Americans. According to Dr. Antonio Levi, author of Samurai from Outer Space, Understanding Japanese Animation, The Japanese see homosexuality as a lifestyle choice, very different from the actual homosexual activity. There is an understanding that you can play with fantasies that you might not want to live out in your normal life. Americans see things in very black and white, you're either gay, or you're not. The Japanese are more comfortable with the concept of being gay and not being gay at the same time. In this case, it makes sense that, in the end, the game is not telling you what to think about kanji or even if he is gay. There's also the mistake of thinking Japanese society is more accepting of gay people because of the popularity of yaoi, or boy love, and yuri, or girl love. And there's lots of media about people cross-dressing, but the vast majority of the media as people refer to the LGBT characters in question are not being respected, they are being fetishized or used as a joke. For Yaoi, the main audience is girls, or Fujoshis, literally translated to dirty women, and for Yuri, the main audience is men. It is not a genuine example of gay love. 
and in any examples where the characters are cross-dressing, it is treated as a joke and they are not treated as the gender they are cross-dressing into. They are not treated as real trans people. Another aspect of it is Japan's culture of shame. A big part of the shame around being gay is that you are expected to live up to the expectation your parents put out for you because they birthed you and raised you and so you owe them your life. Your body is not your own, it's your parents' hope for the future. And being gay is not a part of that hope. They want you to get married and have children and be upstanding members of society and you can't do that when you're gay. So then you failed them. Essentially, from the research I've done, it seems like the key difference from Japan and America is that in Japan, everyone knows what a gay person is, but it's seen as fantasy. It's as possible to be gay as it is possible to be a fairy or a mermaid. And you could engage in behavior such as wearing a mermaid tail or fairy wings, but if you were to go out and say, On all levels except physical, I am a mermaid. <laughs> Give me rights. And wear your mermaid tail to work, that's where the line is drawn. LGBT people in Japan are caught between this feeling of we don't hate you, but we don't accept you either. You exist, but I don't think that you're real. And you aren't illegal, but you're also not legal. So just stay away from us. But if everyone tells you to stay away, where do you go? All in all, while Persona 4 seems like they were trying to tackle representation, Instead, it almost feels as if they went out of their way to do it as badly as possible. And aside from what I've mentioned so far, there's also some sexism, fat phobia, pedophilia, ableism, and of course the racism that comes with nearly all Japanese media and that there are absolutely no characters with dark skin. And while I know that if given more care and maybe, I don't know, a single thought put toward writing these characters, it could be much better, at the same time, I almost want them to just never try to show characters like this again. I mean, I've seen time and time again big companies trying to make things more diverse by including marginalized characters, but then completely screw it up in a way that does more harm than good because they didn't bother to consult anyone of the marginalized group they were writing. I mean, it can even be seen in Persona 5, where before the game came out, Atlas was quoted as saying, As an Atlas game, we try to make games that stand out amongst the crowd, but put in another light, individuality of that sort isn't always a blessing per se. It can mean diverging from what's normal, break from the rules, project the image of trouble, especially when applied to people, we might live in a world that's less than accommodating to a lot of us and hard to live in. But so long as people don't give up on reaching out to one another, the individuality that shines both at the individual level and from groups as a whole can help us break through that feeling of oppression and walk free. This is a game we really want to walk the walk. And that sounds cool, right? Maybe they realized what was wrong with the last game and have learned their lesson? But no, by learning their lesson they decided to include absolutely no gay characters. Except for two grown, effeminate men who on multiple occasions chase after the main characters who are in high school to, assumedly, sexually assault them. The game is from 2016. What the fuck? So in conclusion, Atlas has proven time and time again that they will not learn with the times and improve how they can portray LGBT characters, so I'm revoking their license to use the LGBT community until they can stop using us as jokes or predators. Do better, Atlas. Like on the face of it, they miss the history, but they fight all the places.